25 year old woman and I've been living in Japan for a few years now. It's a beautiful country. Every bit as fascinating and alien as I imagined, but I do have one major complaint. In rural areas where foreigners are a rarity, Japanese men can become a little bit obsessive when it comes to foreign girls, especially fair-haired, blue-eyed girls such as myself. I have dealt with quite a few situations where I was way beyond uncomfortable, even one or two where I feared I might be abducted or worse. One such encounter took place a few years back when I was in my third year of my university course. The following was a very brief encounter, but a terrifying one nonetheless. I was studying abroad at a school in Saitama, essentially a suburb of Tokyo being only 15 miles or so away from the capital city center. I was meeting a lot of new people, making a lot of new friends, getting to really practice my Japanese and generally having the time of my life. One day, after classes were finished, my friends invited me to go shopping with them at a local supermarket to get things for a nabe party. For those who don't know, nabe is basically a potluck dinner kind of thing. You get some fresh vegetables and cuts of meat, then you put a big pot on a little gas burner before everyone gathers around and eats together. It's a huge part of traditional Japanese culture and a great way to socialize. I was over the moon that they invited me. I was usually left out of these kinds of things at first because I was an outsider, whereas they had known each other since their freshman year. Though over the few months that we had been singing together, they'd grown to be like a family to me, each one like an overprotective big brother, especially a guy named Shinji. He was short and a bit on the heavy side, but he was extremely charismatic. Whenever he saw me fumbling around, nervous or confused, he'd quickly appear by my side and throw a heavy arm around my shoulder asking, What's the problem, Jamie-chan? We all went to our friend's house for the party and ended up drinking and talking until pretty late. I checked my phone at one point to discover that it was already like four in the morning. Not only that, but my battery was dying. The guy has already decided that we're going to sleep for a few hours until the train started back up, but I was only about a 30 minute walk away from my shared apartment. I announced that I was leaving and started packing my stuff up. Shinji offered to walk me home, but I politely declined the offer. It would be sunrise soon and it really wasn't all that far. I made it to the station safely, only to see a single car parked outside with a man I didn't recognize leaning up against it. He was staring at me. He was much older than me in his mid-thirties or early forties. His head turned, watching me as I approached the station. I began to pick up my pace a little, crossing to the other side of the street to avoid him as best as I could. But I heard the car door slam and the engine start up. Headlights illuminated me and he turned to drive alongside where I was walking. His window rolled down. Good morning, Gaijin. He said in Japanese, Gaijin meaning foreigner. Are you walking alone? Uh, no, I'm meeting with friends soon. I replied politely. My word, you speak very good Japanese. Where are you going? I started walking faster, pretending not to hear his last question. You're very beautiful. Can I get your phone number? He asked. I have a boyfriend. It was a lie, but I didn't know what else to say. He then proceeded to drive and I figured he'd given up, but he suddenly pulled his car over just ahead of me before he opened the driver's door and got out. Come on, let's go home together. He repeated a little more vehemently taking a few steps towards me on the sidewalk. I panicked, immediately sprinting into a nearby park. There were only a handful of entrances and exits, all of which a car could not enter thanks to some well-placed bollards. I pulled out my phone, immediately calling Shinji. Just my luck though, he didn't answer. He was probably passed out, still drunk on weak Japanese beer. I tried the rest of my group, no one answered. I looked at the next exit just in time to see his car crawl by slowly. He was still searching for me. Trembling in fear, I tried again and again with no success to reach the guys. 
Just as I was about to cry, my phone lit up dimly with a phone call from Shinji. What's the problem, Jamie-chan? He said jokingly. I'd never been so glad to hear those words. In a flurry of words, I explained to him that I was potentially in serious trouble. Though he didn't say a word the entire time, I could practically hear the smile leave his face. In a tone so serious it was almost weird to hear it coming from him, he told me to stay where I was and that he was on his way. But I was already 20 minutes walk away and I wasn't sure that I had 20 minutes before the guy parked his car and came to look for me on foot. I looked behind me again, just in time to see him drive by that exit slowly, looking through. I don't have time. I'm going to make a break for it. Next chance I get. I explained. N no, he said. Wait for me. I can run and be there. But Shinji wasn't a runner, not by any stretch of the imagination. There was absolutely no way he could get there any faster than I could. He started to say something more, but my phone suddenly went dark. Dead battery. No turning back now. I waited a few seconds, and there he was, right on schedule. He crawled by the exit, then stopped, waiting for a moment to pounce. My heart was pounding so hard I could hear a thumping in my chest. The sun was starting to come up now, and he had a better view. It really was, now or never. He slowly moved forward. I crept out of my hiding spot and moved toward the exit. I poked my head out and saw him turn the corner. I sprinted toward my house and didn't look back. I don't know if he saw me and I was too fast to follow or what, but I didn't ever see the guy again. I immediately put my phone in the charger and called the guys back to let them know that I was okay. But Shinji never, ever let me walk home alone in the dark. Again. For a long time, my father has suffered with major anger issues and has a reputation for being very aggressive. My family had to put up with this until I was nine when my parents finally got a divorce. Naturally, mom got full custody, which severely upset my father. He began to obsess over myself and my sister, going so far as to tell us that we shouldn't have boyfriends because he was the only man who could ever truly love us, that no other boy could ever come close. It was this sort of psychological manipulation that led my mom to file for a divorce in the first place. A bad temper is one thing, he was never particularly violent anyway, but mind games can be one of the cruelest forms of emotional abuse. So, my mom had the divorce papers for a good couple of days before she actually put pen to paper. I suppose she wanted to make sure she was making the right decision. Separating kids from their biological fathers can be very bad for them, but... As you can imagine, these were extenuating circumstances. The final straw was the fact that my father admitted to infidelities. This was bad enough, but it was who he did it with that really broke my mom's heart. You see, before he married her, he was in an extremely toxic relationship with a woman we'll call Cruella DeVille. She earned that nickname from myself and my sister who saw her as all fox fur and garish red lipstick. My father was a full 30 minutes late to divorce court, which probably contributed to having his custody rights revoked. Like I said, he was very upset by this and apparently had nowhere to go after moving out of our house. According to my mom, he moved straight in with Cruella de Vil and started drinking heavily. This caused him to show up at the house a few times, drunkenly cursing up at my mom's window. It didn't take long for her to file a restraining order against him. This just made him angrier. This is when things get dark. Somehow, Cruella DeVille convinced my father that they needed to come up with a plan to abduct myself and my little sister. This would secure custody whilst getting back at my mom. We only know this because we live in a small town. Everyone knows everyone, and some good Samaritan heard them planning this stuff and reported them to the police but we didn't actually know that for a little while, not until things had started to escalate in ways that, frankly, terrified us as a family. It started with cars following us. At first, I thought my mom was just being paranoid, 
the stress of the divorce getting the better of her. But she was right. I too began to notice the same gray sedan outside of my school, following us to the grocery store parked outside the house at night. It only stopped when my mom caught the driver taking photos of the house on his smartphone. She threatened to call the cops and we never saw that same car again. Cruella DeVille then added me on Facebook and out of curiosity I accepted. I think I was just curious to check out the kind of life she lived, see if I could gather any information on how my dad was. But when I saw a status basically saying, I can't wait until those two babies are mine, referring to me and my sister, I blocked her. It was horrible thinking that such a terrible woman had designs on us like that. By the time I was 16 and my little sister was 12, my mom granted my father permission to see us every second Saturday. He was great at first. It was lovely to be able to catch up with him, but he soon began displaying some scarily possessive tendencies. One such Saturday, he proceeded to sit me and my sister down and explain to us for a good half hour how we need to tell him exactly where we are and who we're with at pretty much all hours of the day. This was kind of confusing at first, until he explained that he was going to give us each a cell phone to call from and that we were not to tell our mom about the phones. I am so glad I had the presence of mind to ignore these requests. I knew that there was something fishy about it, that Cruella would be involved somehow. I was right. They were relying on these calls from secret phones to plan our abduction. This whole thing comes to a head one day when me and my sister took a short walk to a corner store near our house. My sister needed to pick something up for school and, still being pretty young, my mom demanded that I walk her there and back to ensure her safety. After the car following us and the creepy Facebook statuses, I only happily obliged. So we're at the corner store and I decide to treat us both to an ice cream. We're gazing into the freezer cabinet at the wondrous array of flavors, arguing playfully about which is the best. Suddenly, this rough, burly-looking guy appears next to us, smiling at me and my sister. I gave him this awkward smile back, thinking he's just a regular creep, but when he speaks, I know this is something way different. Are you Jerry's kid? He asks. I just nod and wonder who he is. He says you gotta come with me. He's waiting for you. This was a school night, not a Saturday. I knew he was lying. I immediately walk my sister to the store's counter, we pay for her school supplies, then leave without the ice cream we'd been so looking forward to. But outside of the store, sat in a beat up old van, was Cruella DeVille. She'd made a terrible attempt to disguise herself, and I knew it was her and I swear my blood ran cold as the thought of her creepy Facebook status flashed in my mind. I grabbed my sister by the hand before looking over my shoulder. The burly guy was standing behind us now and this time, he didn't seem so friendly. I screamed, screamed bloody murder at that creep, telling him to get away from me and my sister. I screamed all these terrible names over and over again, pointing at the guy and watching as he started to freak out. People were coming out of the walls to protect me and my sister. It was such a heartwarming display of humanity. Even this local homeless dude got up from his doorway haunt to tell the guy to leave us alone. He got into the van with Cruella and they sped off down the street as an actual angry mob was forming on the sidewalk. My little sister was crying by the time I recognized one of my mom's work buddies in the crowd. She'd known us for years and was sweet as can be. She drove us home and we called the cops immediately. This story doesn't really have an ending. My dad is still incredibly weird. He's attending therapy, but he manages to behave himself much better during our fortnightly visits. He's been improving steadily since a certain woman is out of his life. You see, I did get a kind of closure from this whole event. Recently, my dad had to cancel a Saturday visitation because he was attending a funeral. It was the funeral of Cruella DeVille. She'd overdosed and... Apparently, she had been pushing this on my father, and he stopped taking it when she died. The difference between him now and then is honestly night and day. I thank God he's getting better. It makes me happy beyond words. 
but that feeling is kind of bittersweet because it comes with the acknowledgement that I'm actually happy that this woman is dead. I'm glad she took a little too much and died convulsing on a grubby carpet of some cheap motel. Sometimes, I feel like if I had the chance, I'd have pushed down the plunger of that spike syringe myself just to get a chance at having a normal father again. This all starts with a football match. In late 2016, Liverpool played Everton in one of the most hotly anticipated local derbies in English football. The rivalries between the two teams is beyond intense, dividing communities and sometimes even families. These matches are always tense affairs and this one was no different. The score remained nil-nil up until the very final minute of the game when the glorious Sadio Mane tapped home a scuff shot to bring us victory. The pub I was in exploded. I mean, almost literally. Beer was flying everywhere. Complete strangers were hugging each other. To say the mood was celebratory would be the understatement of the century. It was in that atmosphere of revelry that I met Katie. Not her real name. A petite blonde with shining blue eyes. I was instantly smitten. Myself and Katie spent a few weeks dating, grabbing pizza and beer, binge-watching Netflix. You know the deal. It was a great time, and admittedly, for the first few weeks, she was excellent company. That all changed one afternoon as we were chilling in bed, watching the Netflix series 13 Reasons Why. For those that don't know, 13 Reasons Why is a show about a girl who ends her life. Yes, I appreciate there's a little more complexity to the plot, but... That's the gist of it. So we're chatting away after one of the episodes finishes when, naturally, the subject comes up. Now this is something I told her and it's something I'll tell you too. I have absolutely zero sympathy for people who go through with it. My grandfather ended his own life to avoid a lengthy prison sentence for fraud, while a close uncle drank himself to death after our aunt, his wife, passed away. The coroner reported said that he died of liver failure, but we knew what it was. A perfectly healthy man going from a glass of wine with dinner to two bottles of vodka a day in a space of three or four months. Yeah, we knew well what the score was there. I miss my grandpa and my uncle, but I'm also very angry with them. Through their own short-sightedness, they turned a personal tragedy into boundless heartache for our entire family. I'd give anything just to walk and talk with one of them again, and they took that chance away from me because they felt trapped by something that would work itself out given the time. In a word, it's selfishness. It's the most selfish act a person can commit. They just check out early and leave everyone else to carry their water. Anyway, I guess I'm a bit jaded, but I give this Katie girl the speech, then watch as tears form in her eyes. I assume she's just sad for me, so I instinctively go to give her a hug to tell her that basically I'm over that stuff, that it's painful, but it's behind me. To my absolute shock, she pushes me away and jumps off the bed. I'm really, really confused at this point. She has this angry look on her face, so I decide to keep my mouth shut and wait for whatever she's about to say. Do you have any idea what it feels like to want to go through with that? She says, her voice breaking up. I flat out told her no, that I couldn't imagine being in a position that I would want to give my family its third tragedy in less than ten years. I actually felt like asking her if she'd been listening to a single word I just said. It was almost like she was reacting to a totally different statement. But before I get a chance to ask her, she just storms out, locks herself in the bathroom and refuses to talk to me. After trying and failing to calm her down, I just get my stuff, walk out of her apartment, never to see her in the flesh again. Yeah, you got me. I said in the flesh. So it's obvious this story doesn't end here. Thanks, internet. So I hear nothing from Katie for weeks and I'm glad of it. I'm still really angry she reacted in such a way to me putting my heart on my sleeve, no matter how insensitive it may have seemed. So, when 
notifications pop up on my phone saying Katie sent a photo or whatever, I'm not best pleased. If it wasn't some sort of apology, I told myself I wouldn't be replying. But life just isn't that simple, is it? The picture message is of an online betting website, displaying a whole load of odds on various football matches being played that week. At the very bottom, in the same font and style as the rest of the lettering, were the words, OP, not telling my real name, to end my life, 35 to 1. I told her to F off, blocked her number and Facebook, then tried to push her despicable insult to the back of my mind. It wasn't easy, but I just about managed it. A few days later, there's an email in my Gmail inbox from an address I don't recognize. But as soon as I see that it's just a picture file attachment, no words of it, I know who it is. Lo and behold, the picture is the same betting site screenshot telling me to end my life 35 to 1. I don't even bother replying. Obviously, this is going to happen over and over until she's blocked on all forms of social media. So even though I was in the office, I spent like a third of my workday working through all my social media from LinkedIn to Twitter finding and blocking this absolute crank from contacting me. Little side note, this meant I fell behind on my workload, meaning I had to spend an extra half an hour in the manager's office at the end of the day, getting moaned at relentlessly about the importance of integrity in the face of deadlines. He ended by saying this amounted to a verbal warning. As you can imagine, I left the office in a very, very bad mood. The day only gets worse at this point. I get home to find my flat's door kicked in, like almost booted off the hinges. Raging, I assume it's some local junkie having burgled me senseless, but I find that nothing is missing. Instead, I realize with absolute horror that all of my stuff is either smashed or sliced up. The TV, Xbox, laptop, everything of value that could be easily sold was utterly destroyed. I get on my phone to call the police, apoplectic that it appears to have been vandals instead of thieving smackheads. Christ, at least junkies would find a good home for my stuff. These idiots just smash the place up. But as I do so, there's a message from an unknown number on my phone. A picture message. I know what you're thinking, and you'd be right. But the only thing that was different from the other bloody messages I got off of that complete psychopath were the odds. OP to end his life, 20 to 1. When the police arrived, I took a selfie of myself and the officers and sent it to the unknown number, along with the fact that I had shared the Photoshop betting odds with them too. I assured who I assumed was Katie that if this stuff continued, then she'd be spending a long time behind bars, that there was an obvious connection with the break-in and her messages. I don't know to this day if she got her psycho brothers to do it or paid some local thugs or something, as there was no way she did it all that herself. But the thing that really gets to me is that she didn't know where I lived. Somehow, in between finding my various social media profiles, she had actually managed to find out my home address. Nothing's happened since the police called round and I sent her that selfie of myself and some confused camera-shy policemen but I am still planning on moving. There's no way I'm sticking around here while that woman knows where I live, just waiting for the right time to strike. It was the night of my 18th birthday and I was enjoying my newfound freedom by getting drunk as possible. I'm with my mates at the local Weather Spoons. We've claimed one of the pool tables as our own, and we're having the absolute time of our lives. A couple of tables over there was a group of girls, two or three of them chatting away as they nurse two for one cocktails. One of them catches my eye when I look over, and she is absolutely gorgeous. Long, fiery red hair, bright green eyes, full pink lips. I look away trying to look nonchalant as I take another swig of cider, but she keeps on catching my eye. Eventually, it's my turn to get another round in, so I stroll over to the bar, only to notice the gorgeous redhead doing the same. 
We get to the bar, and I let her order before me, earning instant brownie points before I strike up some conversation with her while our drinks are poured. She tells me her name is Janelle. I make some kind of joke about it being an unusual name. She laughs, and I'm in. Long story short, we ended up going out for a while, always meeting out somewhere, then heading back to mine. Eventually, we drift into actually being a couple, and from there, we start to do more coupley things. And that's when she started acting weird. She starts arguing with me about every little thing imaginable, from not saying hello in the right way to not holding her hand in public. Anything she could turn into a fight, she would. Every argument ends the same way. She threatens to dump me. I coax her back. We kiss. Everyone's happy. After about two months or so, I start getting really sick of it. I do the decent thing. I take her out for coffee to a cozy little cafe, a public place, tell her in the nicest way I can that we're not working out. At first, everything seems really amicable. She said that she understood and as much as it hurt, if it was the right thing to do, then there we are. But it was a front. She didn't take it well at all. And the way she acted then made her former self seem sane in comparison. The phone calls start, always from a private number, always crying. At first to my mobile, then to my home phone. I know she's faking it because if I don't answer the phone, my parents would have a friendly little chat with her, then hand the phone to me and immediately it's like this torrent of crying and whining as soon as I'm on the line. Then the emails start. Wall of text rants of absolute gibberish along with threats and pleading to take her back. And there are hundreds of them. There'd be days when they'd come every five minutes. My phone buzzing in my pocket almost constantly. I changed my number to try to get rid of her. Got a whole new contract with a different carrier. Changed my email too. And that stopped it for a while and that should have been the end of it. Little did I know. I started going online on various forums, games, etc. On one such forum, I struck up a friendship with a girl on there. We had a great time chatting and whatever, and we had so much in common it was completely insane. Not only were we into the same things, but she was this utterly stunning little brunette, like a proper English rose. Anyway, eventually we basically started dating online, having little Skype chats for hours. Things started out well, but... Over time, she got a bit too clingy for my liking. She'd ask where I'd been if I was a minute late or got jealous if she'd seen a picture of me on Facebook with another girl. She got upset at the slightest thing, or angry if I mentioned another girl's name. Even if it was, oh, Maria said she liked my work when Maria was the lecturer for my course. Eventually, I got fed up, dumped her, and we had a nice clean break. I avoided those forums, changed my Skype, and that was that. Not learning my lesson at all, I went on different forums, found another girl, and got to know her too. This was a tan blonde, all breasts and legs, and an incredibly sexy Australian accent. She liked most of the same things I did, with enough difference that we could teach other how to do things, how to appreciate things, how to like things. She was laid back too. Compared to the latest ex, she was a breath of fresh air. If I got on Skype half an hour later than I'd said I would, she was cool with it. Eventually, I talked of meeting her, though it was a long way from England to Sydney and expensive as anything. I was willing to fly to meet her because I wanted to see her face to face, to see the places she told me about, to go to the clubs and bars and restaurants she told me she loved. I wanted to hold her in my arms and kiss her and actually have a proper girlfriend again. She immediately broke up with me, saying I'd only be disappointed with the reality. Then came the latest girl. She was American, brunette, something of a rock chick, completely different to my usual kind of girl. We met on some chat site I used when I was bored, got talking, swapped details, etc., she introduced me to a ton of music I'd never even considered listening to, and I did the same for her. If I complained about something, she told me to man up. If I turned up late, she told me it was fine because time is something the man makes us believe in. She was the coolest girl I'd ever known. 
Again, we dated on Skype. Again, we talked about meeting. Again, she broke up with me, saying that it had all just been in fun or whatever. It was cool. It was amicable and fine, and that was that. All this happened over a couple of years, with me being with each girl anywhere between four and six months, and my between times being made one to three months. I was a quick worker and all about the rebound. Anyway, I came back to my hometown for the holiday. I was wandering along the road when who should I see but Janelle of all people. Rather than avoiding her, I carried on walking. She came up to me, said she had something to tell me and we needed to talk, desperately. I made all kinds of excuses, but each one she batted aside until she wore me down. We went to the pub and she told me something that basically terrified me. She hadn't wanted to give up on me, so she used what she knew of me to find places I'd go online. She made different accounts, lots of different accounts, in the hopes that she'd find me so she could talk to me and try and win me back. Except she'd make fake accounts so I wouldn't immediately ignore her. See where this is going? Yup. Every one of the girls I had dated had been her. Using pictures of friends, using fake accents, pretending to not know things she knew. She'd follow me across at least a dozen different websites, stalk me across hundreds of posts and threads, and all the time had me believe I was talking to completely different people. I didn't date anyone for a couple of years after that. I don't know whatever came of her. After that, she sort of disappeared from my life and I haven't seen her since. I went out briefly with a couple of other girls, but only ones I'd met face to face, who didn't look anything like her at all. I don't know if she still follows me about online or if she does, if she knows about this account. But if you're looking at this, hi, Janelle. The following is taken from a Reddit comment left by a deleted username on a post from a young lady who is suffering at the hands of a stalker. Stalker, such an ugly word, by definition it suggests stealth, a threat, something ominous. But I just wanted to be noticed. There are so many beautiful girls out there, I see them every day, but they don't see me. And I want them to see me. I think you should be grateful that this person has chosen to only pursue you online. They're not trying to be threatening or trying to scare you, they're simply trying to gain your attention, the attention you so wantingly squander on brain-dead, drooling chads who want nothing more than parts of you. People like us are different. We want all of you. Every. Single. Piece. I prefer the word passionate to stalker. I mean, can you not see how much passion this person has, how much time and effort they've taken to finding you on all of your social media? You should be flattered. Not complaining to a bunch of other Stacys on Reddit how fortunate you are to receive such attention. But I do feel like he's made a few mistakes in his approach. I've pursued a handful of girls over the past few years, admittedly, to no avail, but the thing I learned was that a guy should learn to take joy on the subtle things. Just knowing where your potential soulmate is at any one time, learning and mapping out her schedule so you can be there at a special moment in her day, all the while she's totally unaware of your presence. Things like that make you feel smart. They're a rush. He's also making no attempt to mask what he's doing. Reaching out using his own personal social media profiles is a huge mistake. If I could, I'd recommend creating a fake business page that suits her interests. Pad the page out with fake posts. Maybe pay one of those Chinese-like farms a few hundred dollars to make the page look even more legit. Then boom, once she's liked it, you break past her privacy wall and can view all of her posts. All those little check-ins, photos of friends and family, it's so nice to get to know your girl's parents before you meet them. That kind of thing impresses a girl. Another good way to gain access to your girl's possessions is to fake a burglary or break-in. 
Now, this is very risky, but if she happens to live in the inner city, this is definitely a feasible manner of approach. The cops already have a list of usual suspects they're going to turn to. Why on earth would they suspect a mid-twenties community college student who lives in his mom's basement like 10 miles away? They won't. Not unless you've contacted her with your own social media, that poor, desperate fool. If he hadn't been so rash, he could have smashed his way into your apartment while you were at work. The rougher the better. Junkies don't do lockpicks. Grabbed a few electrical items to mask the scent, then helped himself to a fistful of your dirty panties. Trust me, a few pairs of underwear go missing doesn't even register when your $1,500 MacBook is missing. And how often do you lose underwear? Yeah, that's what I thought. I feel like one of the more upsetting things about this post is that the guy is out to hurt you or something. He's obviously smitten with you. Why would he hurt something he clearly loves? I mean, occasionally I feel like if I can't have someone, no one should. But rarely do our kind act on such urges. They're mostly born out of frustration. Like, have you ever even tried talking to this guy? Asking him to stop? From what I understand, the only communication you had was when you were very rude to him. And I don't think this is the kind of situation that you want to escalate so that your pursuer is angry or contemptuous. Like I said, you should be grateful such a passionate person is reaching out to you. We're passionate, not monsters, not by any stretch of the imagination. One time when I got a little too excited to see one of my girls walking home alone at night, I might have rushed after her so I could catch up to say hello. Obviously, this wasn't a brilliant idea, and she got so, so scared. But I'm not the kind of guy to give up easily. Not when such a fruitful opportunity presents itself, so I kept running, following her into a dark piece of parkland. She shouldn't have been wearing such silly footwear. Heels are definitely not designed to run in. So when she tripped and landed in the dirt with a horrible thud, I couldn't help but laugh. I know, hardly gentlemanly of me, but the way she fell and twisted her ankle was just hilarious, like something out of a bad horror movie. When I approached her, I was too out of breath to really say anything, just stood over her, admiring how pretty she looked in the moonlight. She was crying, but it didn't bother me. Nothing could have ruined that moment for me. Nothing. I kneeled down to, I don't know, hold her or something, comfort her in that moment of pain, but she begged, she pleaded with me, please don't. And that's all she needed to say. Please. I'm not a monster. I didn't want to scare her. Even if it was so funny. One little please and I left her alone. I even called her an ambulance as her ankle was askew at this really gross angle, but not before I took a little kiss. As a thank you. So please, rethink your approach to this situation and ask yourself if you were in this guy's position. Lonely. Ignored requiring attention. Would you be acting any different? No, you wouldn't. You'd be desperate not to spend your time on earth alone and end up some used up old spinster with a herd of cats and a dried up snatch. So maybe give this guy a chance. It might be your only option. After all, if he's doing his job properly and he's able to see this post, he might be very, very angry. Indeed. Of all the new mediums of entertainment to come out of the digital age, streaming has to be the most interesting. Raw, candid footage is beamed all around the world while faceless strangers tune in to watch anything from cooking tutorials to gaming sessions, and even some seedier content. This has caused a cosmic shift in how younger people consume media. Traditional forms of entertainment, be it movies or TV shows, are being increasingly neglected in favor of content that provides a considerably more interactive experience. What's more, viewers can contribute financially to their favorite streamers, giving a sense of purpose, belonging, and community that aforementioned media mediums simply cannot offer. 
For example, streamers who play video games online often invite certain viewers to join them in their favorite game, even further breaking down the barriers between creator and consumer. The benefits and rewards are obvious. Some streamers who began streaming games like Players Unknown Battlegrounds or Fortnite just a few years ago in their mom's basement are now self-made multi-millionaires thanks to advertising revenue, sponsorship deals, and subscriber fees. But little is spoken of the negative aspects of putting one's personal life on public display. While the relationship between creators and consumers is mostly a healthy one, there comes occasions where the boundaries of that relationship are crossed, when admiration and affection become obsession and possessiveness. And this is the story of Bianca Devins. Bianca Michelle Devins was born in 2002 in Utica, New York, and grew up there with her stepmother, Kaylee, and sister Olivia. By the time she is 17, she is a petite, pretty young lady with dark brown hair and eyes so dark they're almost black. She loves fashion, Chinese food, and any movie starring Brad Pitt. An interest in fashion led Devins to the photography app Instagram, and naturally it wasn't long before the teenager was taking pictures of herself and posting them to Instagram, earning herself over a 100,000 followers. Her niche seemed to be the pastel pink hair dye and anime uwu chick that Instagram seemed to find irresistible, and Devins soon branched out into other corners of the internet such as 4chan and Discord. This is supposedly where she met Brandon Clark. Despite a claim from the sister Olivia that Brandon Clark was a friend of the family, Devins repeatedly referred to Clark as her internet boyfriend, and sources insist that they had only met a handful of times. What's clear though is that Brandon Clark was under the impression that he and Bianca were dating exclusively, and was heartbroken to discover that Bianca did not share his devotion. In his heartbreak, Clark began spying on Devins, tracking her down in public, creating embarrassing spectacles of himself by begging for her return. In her Discord server, using the name Oxy, Bianca posts cryptic, caveated apologies for hurting those close to her as a result of her own selfishness. It is widely believed that this is referring to the breakdown of her relationship with Clark, Subsequent unconfirmed rumors began to circulate that Devon was increasingly dabbling in hard drugs and BDSM, and was selling nude photographs of herself to fund her new habit. Perhaps most disturbingly, there are reports that Devon's recorded an illicit tape with a member of her Discord server. The footage spread like wildfire online, message boards, and forums, but due to her being a minor at the time of filming, the New York State Police intervened and her online presence diminished considerably as a result. After a brief online silence, Devins broke the news that she and Brandon Clark would be attending a concert by Canadian singer Nicole Dollenganger. The concert would take place in their hometown of Utica, so on the night of the performance, Clark picked up Devins in his SUV and drove her to the show. Clark can be forgiven for thinking that this was some kind of date night, two young lovers attending a performance of ethereal, romantic pop music together. But again... This was simply not what Devins had in mind. Messages on her Discord server reveal that whilst attending the concert, Devins met up with another, different boy, reportedly holding hands and kissing him in full view of Brandon Clark. However, the interaction didn't end there. The trio returned to Clark's SUV to smoke cannabis, with Devins sitting in the back seat with her new boy, sending a clear message to Clark. This must have been objectively humiliating for someone who was surely already feeling insecure about the rekindling of the romance, but what happened next is almost unthinkable. The next day, when Bianca Devins failed to return home, her stepmother began to worry. She called around Bianca's friends, but none had heard from her or Clark since the previous night. It's about then that Devins' stepmother called the Utica Police Department to report Bianca missing, Yet, around the same time that these phone calls are taking place, an Instagram account with the username YesJuliet posts a teaser of a new Little Peep album that they supposedly have exclusive information on. Hype begins to build in the year and a half since the musician's accidental overdosing interest in him has skyrocketed, but the following posts do not concern a new record. 
Yes, Juliet is the Instagram account of Brandon Clark, and the photographs he is about to upload will horrify all that see them. The first is the body of a young woman who bears a strong resemblance to Bianca Devins. She has the same dark eyes, the same sculpted nose, the same messy brunette hair. As she lies in the passenger seat of an indistinguishable vehicle, blood is soaked into her clothes, red flecks of it plastering her lifeless facial features. She has a huge, jagged slice in her throat. The picture is immediately shared to Discord where some users simply cannot believe what they are seeing. The body is in such a horrendous state that many fail to recognize their teenage idol, saying the resemblance to Devon's is a strong one, but that it simply cannot be her. Try to reverse image search on this, found nothing. Who is this girl, OP? Another person asks. The next photo shows a green tarp on the floor of a forest, the clear shape of a lifeless corpse underneath it. The caption reads, I'm sorry, Bianca. But this is somehow still not the most traumatic of all the photos. The next takes that title easily. Brandon Clark proceeds to upload a photograph of himself, his head resting on the covered dead body of his former lover. He has cut his own throat. His lips are pursed with pain, the color draining from his face, the wound to the left side of his neck, the same side as the fatal wound that Bianca suffered at his very own hands. Ashes to ashes, reads the caption. Little is known about the investigation other than that Brandon Clark has been charged with her murder. How he came to survive this attempt is open to speculation. Perhaps a jogger or dog walker came across the grisly scene and called for medical help. Or perhaps Brandon Clark is more cowardly than he is dastardly and called for his own ambulance. He was, after all, posting pictures of himself in his dying moments via smartphone. It's no great leap of the imagination that he was simply afraid to die and hit 911 himself. Bianca Devins lived her life online, and no doubt it enriched her life for a while. But in the end, the exposure she sought was ultimately her demise. There is no doubt that Brandon Clark was an evil, cowardly, obsessive person who is entirely to blame for Bianca's death. But there is also no doubt that his malevolent ways were exacerbated by a life lived in the public eye. But regardless, the lifestyle Bianca chose to lead did not warrant the kind of violent death she suffered. What happened was an avoidable tragedy, a callous crime committed by a cretinous coward. May Bianca Michelle Devins rest in peace. It all started with a Reddit comment. I saw a change my view post about trans pronouns that advocated the use of unconventional pronouns such as Zim or Zer. I've always thought this was the height of silliness. I'm not anti-trans by any stretch of the imagination, but inventing sci-fi sounding pronouns for an already isolated section of society is no way to solve the problem of inclusion. So I simply stated as such. I don't believe my comment was offensive or inflammatory. I made it clear I sympathized with anyone in the grip of an identity crisis. After all, even the ancient Grecian philosopher Thales said that the most difficult thing in life is to know oneself. But as you can imagine, after a few odd upvotes, the post was brigaded by various left-wing subreddits as vote manipulation and abusive responses sent the comments section into chaos. Nothing new to Reddit, I'm sure many of you will understand. But I wasn't expecting the personal messages to start appearing in my inbox, messages that mentioned the writer wanting me to die in a fire, for my mom to get bone cancer, and other such creative put-downs. I was dismayed, sure, but I just blocked the users and carried on with my day. The next morning when I arrived into work, I was immediately called into a meeting with our office manager. I didn't suspect a thing. Morning meetings were hardly a rarity, so I was relaxed as could be when I strolled into his office and took a seat. But when I saw the look on his face, I knew something serious was afoot. He was nervous, which wasn't like him at all. In his hands were a few sheets of printer paper. He starts asking me if I have anything I'd like to share with him. That old routine. 
and in the politest way possible, I asked him to cut it out and tell me what the issue was. I had hit all my monthly deadlines, my client review was the best in our region, I had nothing to hide and nothing to be afraid of, or so I thought. He put the sheets of paper down in front of me. The letterhead bore the logo of our country police force. I read with absolute disbelief how it stated that I was subject to an investigation pertaining to a trafficking ring that was targeting deaf children around the state. I tried to explain that there had to be some kind of mistake, that there was no way these documents were real or if they were, that it had to be someone who shared my name. I received no contact from local law enforcement and all it would take were a few phone calls on management's parts to confirm this. But the more desperate I got, the less my manager seemed to believe me. He seemed genuinely sorry to have to do it, but he told me I would be suspended from work on full pay until the situation resolved itself. I couldn't believe it. I just sat there, numb, as he apologized and asked me to vacate the building before lunchtime. I was still in shock as I drove home, unable to quite compute just what had gone down that morning. Yet I remained confident that the situation would blow over once the company discovered just how grave an error had been made. When I reached the neighborhood my apartment was located in, I noticed a large pickup parked outside my building, one I'd never seen before. Any other day I'd have just ignored it, but something about this particular day told me to expect the unexpected. Bad things do come in threes, after all. I wasn't wrong. Hey! Hey, you! An angry, grizzled voice came as I was halfway to the door of my apartment. You think it real funny, huh? Excuse me? You think it's funny to make jokes about a woman's terminal illness? Wait, what? No! Who? But then it clicked. This was another case of mistaken identity. It had to be. I started to explain that this was some kind of mistake and that I'd never seen him before in my life and that there was no way I'd ever make some obnoxious comments about fatal illnesses. The punch hit me before I could even react. I had never been a fighter. I wasn't even remotely athletic. So when I saw the guy's fists flying through the air in an almost cartoonish slow motion, I just froze. The next thing I knew was coming to on the steps of my apartment building as this pickup truck, owning tough guy, was still barking obscenities at me. My ears were ringing. I could taste blood in my mouth. I felt so dizzy I was nauseous, but something the guy said brought me out of it in an instant. You think you can run your mouth just because you got a Reddit account? Not so anonymous now, huh? I was too winded to respond. I... Those words echoed around my skull. Reddit my Reddit account. Suddenly the penny dropped. After the guy drove off, I dragged myself up from the concrete, hobbling up the stairs into my apartment and over to my laptop. It was my post history. I realized in horror that there was a lot of personal detail in my post history. Nothing concrete, but it wouldn't take someone a whole lot to piece together certain snippets of information to gain a rough picture of who I was. It seems someone had done just that. There was no other explanation. In a flurry of clicks, I deleted all the posts and comments that someone could use to glean information on me. The bad, unexpected things stopped happening after a few days. The final straw was when someone spray-painted transphobe on the door of my apartment in bright yellow lettering. It was only then that I truly realized what was going on. Some absolute psycho had seen my comment on the trans pronoun question and decided to dox me. I'm still not 100% sure how they managed to, or the extent of the doxing, but I know things started to calm down once I moved apartments and cleared my name with the local police. I suppose the lesson from all of this is to be very, very careful just what information you release online. There are some very unsavory people out there who despite their claim of moral superiority, are nothing more than hateful, spiteful stalkers. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. 
If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located on both Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and remember to protect your cult leader.